After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Adam. Sometimes life can get very confusing, uh, and sometimes we're not. We're even confused about whether what we just heard was good news or bad news. Uh, this week, I was reminded of the story of two women who had been great college friends, but had gone their separate ways, and and uh, saw each other at their 25-year reunion. So they were so excited about getting caught up, and and one of them said, "Oh." I got married. And the second one said, oh, that's such good news. And, and, the, and the first one said, but he's so mean. Oh, that's bad news. But he's very wealthy. Oh, that's good news. But he's very stingy. Oh, that's bad news. But he bought me a house. Oh, that's good news. But it burned down. Oh, that's bad news. But he was in it. <laughs> Good news or bad news? Well, uh, these two ladies are not the only ones to be confused about life. Uh, in your handout, I've put down uh, sort of a summary of, of sort of historically what have been the different philosophical movements that have tried to define what's the essence of life. Um, Greece said, be wise, know yourself. Ancient Rome said, be strong, discipline yourself. Judaism says, be holy, conform yourself. Epicureanism says, be sensuous, enjoy yourself. Education says, be resourceful, expand yourself. Psychology says, be confident, fulfill yourself. Materialism says, be acquisitive, please yourself. Pride says, be superior promote yourself. Asceticism says, be inferior, suppress yourself. Diplomacy says, be reasonable, control yourself. Communism says, be collective, secure yourself. Humanism says, be capable, trust yourself. Philanthropy says, be unselfish, give yourself. Now, when I think of all these things on here, I think these are sort of like the lyrics of a really bad cultural song uh, where you have a cacophony of sound but no melody. What does it mean to really live? And that's our topic that John 5 deals with today. What does it mean to live? What does it mean to have life? Not physical life, but life that which makes life worth living. And Jesus will contrast that and we will see it illustrated in this chapter several different ways. What does it mean to be living in death while we're here in this world? Uh, our the chapter begins with a story that Adam just read of a, a man who'd been paralyzed for 38 years. Verse 2 begins, There is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool. In Aramaic, it's called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five colored colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, several different uh, artists have tried to visualize this for us, and, and we have a couple of pictures. Uh, this is a pretty good picture of what it, it may have looked like. You can see the pool on the left, and stone is, is the great architectural feature back then. Uh, and so there are the steps there, and there are the walls, and, and what created the pool, or what allowed the, the water to stay within the pool. And then you can also see some of the people who are depicted in, in the story here of trying to get in the water. And here's where the story where Jesus is meeting a man, the, the paralytic here, uh, who's 
been an invalid for 38 years. So that kind of gives you the, the picture of, of what's happening in this story. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now, that seems like a rather odd question, doesn't it? Do you want to get well? And I, I would think that, you know, you would say, well, duh, I'm here, and I've been here for a long time. Of course I want to get well. Why would Jesus ask this man, do you want to get well? Now, you probably don't have to think too hard about your experience in talking with people. How many times have you found yourself talking to someone, and it becomes apparent to you as you're listening that there is some need that this person has? It can be a financial need. It can be a personal need. It can be uh, uh, some help with time or help with a project, uh, maybe something at home uh, or moving. And you, you say, you know what, I'd be glad to help you with that. How many times have you heard this response? No, I'm good. No, I'm fine. It seems like that happens all the time. Now, there are times where the person really is good and it really is fine. But I often wonder how many times do, do we say those words, I'm good, I'm fine, not because we couldn't use the help, but because we're too proud to ask for help. In the situation that, that, we're, that I'm describing here, it really comes down to this. No humility, no help. If somebody would just say, I could really use some help on moving day, that would be great. Or if you wanted to help out with this project, that would be great. Or, yes, we could use some money to help pay for this. That would be great. Plenty of help is coming down the pike. And I wonder for Jesus and this particular man if the same thing is not going on in his heart. No humility. No help. Uh, verse 7. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And Jesus sort of ignores what he said, just gets straight to the point. He said to him, get up, take up your mat, and walk. Get up, take up your mat, and walk. And verse 9 says that he was healed instantly. When I think about uh, why did he say, pick up your mat and walk, I wonder if it's something related to what we just described here of humbly responding to what has just been said, obeying the instructions, following what he's humbling yourself and obeying instructions, obeying Jesus. I wonder how often that's really what Jesus is after in our life. Some humility and some obedience even in our most difficult situations. Uh, and the man is healed, verse 9. But now we get into sort of the aftermath of this story. And what does life and death look like in, in human beings? And we'll see this illustrated with several different situations. It's been commonly said that if, uh, if the president of the United States that you don't like invented cancer or, or uh, um, found a cure for cancer, that you would find a way to criticize him anyway. I've heard that for decades. Um, and in this particular situation, uh, Jesus heals this particular man. And so guess what is going to happen? Verse 9, the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Now, this is a rather odd response, isn't it? Jesus, uh, or this man had apparently been in Jerusalem for a long time. Jerusalem was not that big a city at the time. The Pharisees walked the, the city all the time. This was a very public situation here. Surely they knew this particular paralytic. An invalid for 38 years. And you suddenly see this man walking. What's the, what's the thing that, that would just come blasting out of you next? Oh my gosh, praise the Lord. What happened? Tell me your story. Those would be words of life. Instead, what we get from the Pharisees are words of Death. It is the Sabbath. First thing they say to him, the law forbids you to carry your mat. What, what does law, what do the words of death um, carry with them? What's important to them is, is more important than what's important to you. 
And if they see anything wrong in the, in the person they're talking to, they're the ones to surely correct it. And if you need to be rebuked, you can count on me to give you a rebuke. These are words of death. I wonder how the man felt as he stood there after having been an invalid for 30 years and then gets his hand slapped for picking up his mat on the Sabbath. Those are words of death. Verse 11, he replied, the man who made me well said to me, meaning he's going to throw Jesus under the bus. Again, another picture of words of death. Don't blame me. He said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walked? Not that, oh, it was Jesus that healed you? <laughs> we need to go find out more about this guy. Nope. It was him that told you to do this? Verse 13, the man had no idea who had healed him, who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. This is another little picture of death to me. You've been an invalid for 38 years. This man tells you to rise, pick up your mat, and walk. You pick up your mat and start walking. And you don't take any time to figure out who this guy is. Ask his name, talk to him, thank him. None of that is in here. Again, this is another picture of the absence of life. Pick, mini picture of death. Verse 14, later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well again, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now we have no indication that these two men had ever met prior to this instance. Think about this. Think about if you were the paralytic and Jesus came up to you and, and healed you to where you got up and later you run into him and he says to you, see you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse befall you. What would go through your mind? In this particular case, it's implied that the man had become a paralytic through some stupid choice of his own, probably precipitated by uh, the famous Seth Gatchel words, hey, has anybody ever seen somebody do this? And, uh, and, and sure enough, well, not that way. Um, there's some connection here, apparently, between what he had done, some stupid choice, and his condition. That's not always the case. There's not always a cause and effect uh, of sin and suffering. Sometimes we suffer for, for no apparent reason that, or that we're aware of until much later on in life. But this is also a, a double warning in here. What is the something worse that may happen to you? Well, something worse than being a paralytic in this life? Or does he mean something else? This is a double warning, I think, that um, sin is serious, and you lived a life where sin wasn't all that serious to you, but you've seen the consequences it's time to take sin seriously in your, in your life and run from it and run to righteousness because if you allow sin to get rooted in you and build deeper and deeper and deeper, after you leave this earth, you are going to find the something worse than even what we talk about, hell on earth. Well, the story continues on into verse 16. Verse 16. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. <clears throat> we have our own version of this here in America and in Western civilization. We call it cancel culture. Cancel culture. Somebody does something that you disagree with, and you're going to shame them publicly. You're going to put it out there on social media so that everybody knows what this person does. You're going to correct them. And after all that's done, then you're going to make them pay. You're going to pay with their job, pay with their career, pay with their reputation. This is a culture of death. This is death that runs through the veins of people. All of us are capable of this. You may not have been a participant in, in cancel culture. You may have just been a participant of words of death in social media. 
where somebody posts something, that, again, of which you disagree with. And of course, the first thing you lock on to is not the point, all the points of agreement. It's that one point of disagreement and anger riles up in you. And what you believe is that this needs to be corrected. They can't think this way. They don't have the facts. They haven't been to the fact checkers. And so they're on social media for all of your friends and their friends to see. You give them your great wisdom. These are words of death. Death is flowing through the, the, the veins of who you are, your heart and your soul. And they come out through your mouth and through your fingertips. Words of death. Recently, we have a good friend of ours that uh, uh, a lot of people know. Um, uh, she's a pastor's wife, and she got her COVID shot. And, and she made an attempt on social media to encourage people who had not had the shot, but, but who wanted to, but they were anxious about this and somewhat fearful about this to go ahead and do it. And, and she, there are a lot of people follow her and know her, and she has a, a ton of respect. Mindy and I both respect this lady greatly. But guess what happened? The knives and the wolves came out on social media, and all kinds of words of death began to flow on her page. To, the, to such an extent that she ended up deleting the whole post. Words of death. Uh, I was reminded recently uh, how many young, young marrieds, either a husband or a wife, have told me, you know, it wasn't until I got married that I discovered all the wrong ways that apparently I was doing on how to load a dishwasher. Words of death. Oh, but you have to do it the right way. You have to do it the most efficient way. This is what my mother taught me how to load a dishwasher. If you put the bowls in this way, they're not going to get clean. Why do we have to say things like that? Because of a culture of death that resides in the soul. I have to be right. I have to be superior. I have to be the one in the know. I have to be the one that has this down. I have to be the efficient one. Really. Death. Death, 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 words of death. I think about our, uh, these, this situation here with the Pharisees. A man is healed. And yet these guys, they would be, these Pharisees would be great modern day journalists. Instead of looking at how the healing was done, they're looking for a way to discredit Jesus. And so... All of a sudden, these journalists with the culture of death running through them, these Pharisees are out to figure out a way to discredit him. You know, there'd be a lot of openings in today in the news media for these guys. And you know what? Some of these guys could run for Congress today. We're going to call for a special prosecutor to, to take down Jesus and have some, have some, uh, some bring in some uh, facts here. Verse 17. My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, up until this point, we have seen lots of illustrations of death, predominantly in the Pharisees, and some even with the man who was healed. And now Jesus contrasts what we've seen so far in this chapter with life and what life looks like. And what he does is he takes us up and gives us a peek into heaven. What was it like for Father and Son and Holy Spirit to be together? What kind of relationship was going on? And what Jesus is describing is one of life. Verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. What's he describing there? What does life look like here? It looks like humility of learning to cooperate with somebody else, even though you may not want to do what they're doing. Because the father and what, whatever the father does, the son also does. What's he describing there? It's the quality of deference, deferring to one another, words of life. The father loves the son. That one speaks for itself. 
and shows him all he does. Teamwork is what's being described here. Yes, to his amazement, he will show you even greater things than these. Verse 22, moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. Delegation and trust that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Now, th this may seem a little sort of ethereal, eternal, heavenly. But if you went back and took these particular traits that Jesus just described here and applied them to your marriage, maybe this would come a little bit closer to home on our need for this kind of heavenly life in it. Imagine if you were able to, with a magic wand, suddenly be a person of humility toward your spouse, of deferring to your spouse, not grudgingly, but willingly. Imagine if you saw yourself as a teammate and not a competitor or a rival, loving your spouse the way they like to be loved and trusting yourself to them and trusting them with some of the things in your marriage and then honoring one another. Huh. Wow. I wonder what would happen in most people's marriages if the life of God that's in, that was displayed to the son and the son back to the father and that they want to entrust into you and have coursing through your veins. I wonder what that would do in people's marriages. Verse 21. Just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, the son gives life to those to whom he is pleased. And here he's using uh, uh, two different uh, arenas here, the physical arena of, of death to life and the personal arena that we are living in now of raising somebody out of this death that courses through our vein and puts us into the picture of life. And now he takes this, this father, son, life, the picture we just had, and he describes what he wants to do with us. Verse 21. As the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased. Now, what is that life that, that's described? Well, we've looked at honor and love and trust, deference and humility. It's really that which makes life worth living in, in its summary. It's that which can, can reach down to the deepest recesses of the soul and provide a satisfaction that can be found nowhere else or reaches into the, makes possible the deepest kinds of connections with people that we just can't do on our own. Uh, and then this is going to be contrasted with, of course, death. Now, what are we to do with life? As we looked at last week, and if you saw the illustration of the cup, we are simply to do two things with this life. We are to enjoy it. And secondly, we are to reflect it. We let the joy that we understand in Jesus the life that he has that comes into our life to enjoy it, and we let that pass through us out into the lives of other people. Verse 24, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. That, uh, that word uh, crossed over, that verb in the Greek, means to a change of location or a change of country. What he's describing here are two countries that people live in. Either you live in the land of death or you live in the land of life. Either what's coursing through you are still words and thoughts of death or words and thoughts of life. And what he says here is that it's possible to, to get transferred out of one life and cross over into another one through the gospel. Verse 25, I tell you the truth, the time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. As the Father has life in himself, he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. And so again, he's describing sort of the, the physical world uh, of death and life and that uh, when, we, when we die, it's not over. There's something else that's going to happen. Either we will live eternally in the land of death or we will live eternally in the land of life. 
But he's also talking about our current life here. Either we, like the Pharisees and the, the paralytic, are living in the land of death, and what comes out of our mouth are words of death, or we're living in the land of life. Now, when I think about this, I often, often wonder, well, what is it that we think is life? What does our culture tell us is life? Uh, success, uh, or travel, or time, or some of the things that I think about, or health. Uh, and, and those things are, are all nice, they're good things. But this life is more than the blessings that God gives us. And it's more than an experience of God. It's the life of God that we know in him and then reflected out to people. It's not complete until it's reflected. It's not experienced until it's reflected out to other people, flowing in and flowing out. Um, on the back of your handout, the chapter finishes with five witnesses of Jesus' identity. And the purpose of this section, I think, is to tell the Pharisees, you're, lit, you're thinking just inside the box about the Messiah. You're thinking about that the Messiah is going to be a, a, a ruler who's going to come and reestablish Israel uh, as, a, as a powerhouse nation. You're also thinking within another box, and that is that the spirit, that the supernatural really doesn't exist here. We're going to be able to explain the Messiah. And in other chapters of John, which we're coming to, you will see this illustrated again and again. But as we go through these verses, there are five witnesses of, that Jesus talks about, about his identity. And uh, in order to try to sort of help you see uh, these things, in your handout, they're listed, one through five, we'll go through. And in your handout, I've also bolded and underlined each of these so that you can, it's easy in this passage to sort of read it and go, huh, at the end. So the five witnesses are John the Baptist. Jesus' work is a testimony to his identity as, as divine. God the Father has a test, testifies to the divinity of Christ. The scriptures testify to the divinity of Christ. And Moses testifies to the divinity of Christ. So let's read through this passage. And we'll look at each of these five. Verse 31. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. That, that's true in any, any court. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You have sent to John. There's our first witness. He has testified to the truth. John was a lamp that burned and gave light. And you chose for a time to enjoy his light. Verse 36. I have a testimony weightier than that of John. The very work that the Father has given me to finish, which I am doing, testifies the Father has sent me. Number three, verse 37, the Father has sent me, has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. This should have been a huge wake-up call to these Pharisees. Verse 39, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness to me. Number four. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. But I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. Another slap in the face. A wake up call. What is he saying? What are we missing? Should have been the response of these men. I have come in my father's name and you do not accept me. If someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe who accept praise from one another yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God? And that question, in my opinion, is a great question for our culture. It seems to me that most people decide on their beliefs because of the acceptance of the people that they run with. In other words, our beliefs are less by the rationality we imagine they are and more by the connections that we enjoy in relating to people who believe just like I do. Verse 45, but do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, number five. You should believe me for he wrote about me, but since you do not believe what he wrote, I, how are you going to believe what I say? 
Life and death. Life and death. What is coursing through you? Uh, last week we looked at an uh, a nice little illustration that, that a number of you uh, commented on that, you, that uh, was very helpful to you. And we're going to uh, sort of reenact a little bit of that story and add a little bit to it. Um, and this, this is, represents the life of God uh, in this tea here that, that he wants to give to us. And this represents the, the sin water that we drink, whatever our particular kind of sin is that we think will fill us up. And uh, as we illustrated last week, is that you, what we're meant to do is for our soul to come under here, and we turn on the, the tea, the soul comes into the cup, and there's a hole in the cup, which is a good thing, and the hole is, is meant to be reflected to the people around us. Now, what I'd like to add to that illustration is that we looked at this particular, the sin that we pursue. But what I'd like to add to this particular story is what is the effect of sin to our souls? And the effect of sin to our souls is I've added something to our cup, our soul, our heart, and that is nails. When we sin, and particularly when we continue in patterns of sin, we, without being able to see it, although we may be able to feel it over time, are adding nails to our own soul, poking holes in it. And over a long period of time, we have a lot of holes in our soul. Now, what happens the more holes you have in your soul? It's harder and harder to fill this up. And what we end up with is something like this. Sorry, Lance. <laughs> Somehow, we all knew that was going to happen. Now, that's one way of looking at our soul. Another way of looking at our soul and the consequences of sin is that our soul, I don't know if you can see this, but our soul begins to take on the tint of green. Think of lake water. Is this, is this visible? Can you see, see it then? Sort of like scum over a long period of time. We live in a culture of death. Death is running through our veins. We don't have to live that way. We can be taken into a culture of life. I'd like to end with a story that uh, illustrates this uh, rather remarkably. Uh, in, in a book called Who's Coming to Dinner, uh, Bob Morgan writes a, uh, a true story about a Dutch pastor and his family during World War II. Uh, during the German occupation of Holland, they were trying to hide Jews like many Christians did during those days, although you would never know that if you take a modern history class or if you read the New York Times. But uh, many people did that, and this particular family decided to do that, and they uh, kept as many Jewish people in their home as they could to keep them from the Nazis. Uh, every day they lived with a certain amount of great fear of being caught. One night, about midnight, they heard the screeching of tires outside. Men yelling. The sound of boots pounding outside. And then the unmistakable pounding on the door. And within seconds, that family was arrested, marched outside in the darkness, put in the back of a truck, and taken down to the railroad tracks. And when they got out, they saw hundreds of people lining the railroad tracks and then they were all ushered to get into the cattle car. Of course, the family knew what that meant. They got up into the cattle car, and they were packed in there like sardines. The doors closed, and in the darkness, the train took off. Well, the family knew what was going to happen. They were off to the concentration camp, the extermination camp. 
And it was with heartbreaking anguish that they sat in the darkness there, huddled together, uh, being jostled back and forth as the train made its way uh, in the darkness and, and thinking about what was going to happen on the other end. There was terror running through them. The only question was, where are they going to end up? Will they end up at Auschwitz? Buchenwald? Dachau? The train went all night in the darkness. And then it slowed down and came to a halt. And the doors of all the cattle cars were opened in the entire train. And the people were told to get out. And the people got out. And they were told to stand along the railway line, which they did. And then an amazing thing happened. They looked around, and they weren't at a concentration camp. In fact, they weren't even in Germany. They saw Swiss flags. They were in Switzerland. In that gloom of the morning and the gloom of the people on the train, good news finally broke through. They weren't going to a concentration camp. They were in freedom. Now, what had happened? Unbeknownst to anybody on that train, somebody that night, at great cost to their life, tripped a switch on a railroad track and moved the train from heading to the land of death at a concentration camp, to the land of life in Switzerland. The switch. When the pastor, the Dutch pastor, realized this, he stood there. He said, what should we do with such a gift? Then at that moment, the people that were from the town who were walking toward them were not coming to take them off to the uh, extermination camps. They were coming to welcome them to the land of life. Instead of being marched off to death, they were being welcomed into life. This is the gospel story with one added note. The one that risked his life to, to flip the switch, for us, it cost him his life. He risked it, and it cost it. But we did that to bring you and me out of the land of death to the land of life. And my question for you today where do you live? What's coursing through your veins? Words of death? Thoughts of death? Somebody to criticize? Somebody to let know that there's something different that they hadn't thought about? You need to go to the fact checkers. You are living in the land of death. Instead of the land of life. What the father and son have known for years... They desire to pour into your soul and my soul. Let's pray together. Father, would you help us to see what you want us to see in John chapter 5? And rather than just say, oh, I'm good. I'm fine. I don't need to think about this. To ask ourselves with some humility, am I living in the land of death? Am I giving people words of death? Am I withholding life? Or am I living in the land of life and giving words of life to the people around me? If you find yourself living in the land of death, what you will notice is that you will do that without even thinking. You don't even have to intentionally live in the land of death. You will do it by nature. You will reach for the green pitcher every time. And you will pour that green pitcher into your cup every time, believing that's what your soul needs. And every time you add another nail to your soul and turn your soul a little more green. Something of this hit me the night I became a Christian at age 20. And I asked myself, 
What am I doing with my life? And I didn't mean my education or my career. What am I doing to my soul? What am I doing to my heart? And when I finally asked that question, what came to my mind was, is that I am a lost sheep or like the blackened sheep in need of the, of the Savior to come and change me. That's what Jesus says to these guys over and over again. I can call you out of darkness and give you life. It's simply a matter of saying to God, God, I'm not fine and I'm not good. I need to be taken out of the land of death and into the land of life. And Jesus says, believe me, trust me, and trust yourself to me. And I can move you from one country to another. Lord Jesus, come into our lives and transfer us, if we've never done this, from the kingdom of death to the kingdom of life.